Hi everyone, today I'm going to be giving you an introduction to some important concepts that should help you to learn coding, while also clearing up some common misconceptions. Recently I've received a lot of requests asking for breakdowns on how I make generation tools for Blender, but before I make any content like this, I feel like it's a good idea to talk about some of the concepts that are quite important to understand, and are universal to any kind of coding. At the end of this video, you should have a basic understanding of the different types of logic and when they are applicable, what abstraction means, how to access data, and how to avoid obscure statements. This is something that you should ideally watch before starting a beginner's course on a language of your choice. The intention of this video is not to teach you how to code in a specific language, but to introduce you to important concepts that will help you with any language you choose. Keeping this in mind, I've tried to write this video in a way that's not specific to any particular language to make it viable as an addition to any course. Before we jump into it, we should probably talk about the difference between a scripting language and a programming language. A programming language is usually one where the code needs to be compiled, which is where it's converted into a format that's easy for the computer to understand. Compiled code tends to run a lot faster than code from other languages that is not compiled. A scripting language is quite often a simpler type of language that does not require the code to be compiled before running it, but instead uses something called an interpreter that appropriately interprets the code when you want to run it. But the line between these two definitions is getting more subjective and blurry due to the emergence of hybrid languages that can run both compiled and non-compiled code. The difference between the terms is not that important, but it's just something to keep in mind because you will often see them used interchangeably. So we're going to start this off with a misconception, and that's, you need to be really good at maths to code. This is not true. Being good at maths is not a requirement to get into coding at all. Would it help to be a maths genius? Yes, of course it would, but it's definitely not a requirement. In fact, the only part of mathematics that you really need to know to start coding is a basic understanding of how basic operations work, meaning you should at least know what these symbols mean and what they do to numbers. In reality, the kind of program you want to make will dictate whether or not you require a good understanding of a specific mathematical subject. But this is when we need to talk about the different kinds of logic you will use when coding. The type of logic you use to generate space stations, for example, is very different from the kind of logic you would use to tell a robot arm where to move. One of these requires instructional logic, whereas the other requires a more traditional form of mathematical logic. Instructional logic, which I also call conversational logic, flows like a regular conversation or spoken language. It's a list of instructions, one after the other, that clearly explain what to do. It will sound something like, for every piece of bread on the table, put jam on the knife, and then use the knife to spread the jam on the bread. They are just like spoken instructions, and in most general scripting languages, this is the kind of logic you will be using the majority of the time. Mathematical logic in this context is usually applied when a very specific kind of functionality needs to be made that can only be achieved through some form of calculation. In the case of the robot arm example, getting the arm to pick up an object at a specific location requires that the angles of each axis, as well as the physical forces that act on them, are calculated mathematically to achieve the goal. Instructional logic is the same kind of logic you would use to tell another person to do something, like go to the shops and buy all of the items on a list, including any specific conditions, such as if the donuts are under one dollar, then buy three of them. When coding, you'll be using many pre-made functions to tell the computer to do common tasks. A common task for a person could be something like blinking or grabbing an object with a hand. A common task for a computer might be something like writing text to a file, loading a web page, or showing a graphic on the screen. Now of course, there won't be a function for everything you want to do. That's why you will often have to write your own. When doing this, you typically work with two main structures of data, which are functions and variables. Functions are like packets of code that you can call upon to repeat tasks without having to write out the individual instructions all over again. For example, if I was creating a video game, I might have a function called move character, where I can give it some information and it will move a character to a location I provide. Inside of this function are a long list of individual commands to make the character move. But if I had to write all of these lines of code every single time I wanted to move the character, then it would be extremely inefficient and the code would get very messy. This is why functions are useful, because instead of writing out all of the code, you just have to write the function, and when the computer reaches this line, it will automatically run all of the associated lines for you. If you go on to learn a programming language after this video, you will find out how to create and use functions for that specific language. Variables are like containers of data stored in memory. If you did maths in school, this is something you may have already encountered. You may have done exercises where you needed to find the value of x. Well, x is an example of a variable. It's basically a word or letter of some kind that represents data. For example, in my program I might write something like this. First name equals Curtis, and last name equals Holt. First name and last name are variables that represent the text. Once variables have been created, they can be used to make other things, 
For example, I could make a new variable by combining these two. Full name equals first name plus empty space plus last name. The reason why I've added empty space in between the variables is because without it, first name plus last name would literally just squash the words together, and there would be no space in between the names. Notice how we can use mathematical operations on things that aren't just numbers. Variables don't have to be just text or numbers, they can be all sorts of other types of objects as well, but the discussion of data types will vary by language, so we won't cover it in this video. Keeping these structures in mind, it's when you come to writing your own functionality that the logic tends to move from instructional to mathematical. Now one disclaimer I need to give before we continue is that not all languages work in the same way, and there will be many exceptions to the things I tell you, but once we've talked about some of the important concepts we'll revisit some examples and I'll explain why what I've told you can be viewed from other perspectives. This is where we're going to talk about abstraction, which is a word that might appear confusing at first because it has many meanings depending on the context in which it's used, but I'll do my best to explain it for examples. The term abstraction will mean different things to different people in different fields, a philosopher might say that an abstraction is something that only exists as an idea. An artist might say that an abstraction is a different way of viewing the world. But in regards to computing and specifically programming, abstraction, often heard in the phrase layer of abstraction, is a way of describing levels of control. To briefly sum it up, abstraction in computing is where we can control many things with fewer actions. Think about the steering wheel in a car. Instead of moving each wheel manually, you can move multiple at once by turning the steering wheel, of course depending on the type of car. This means that the steering wheel is at a higher layer of abstraction than the regular car wheels. Another example that applies on a more personal level is your own body. Your brain is a master of abstraction. Just think about how you have almost complete control over how your body moves. You can control your limbs just by thinking about them, without having to worry about all of the individual muscles and bones and tendons and everything else inside. Abstraction is a fundamental concept in computer programming, because many of the most popular languages available will provide the user with access to a high degree of abstraction through a powerful set of pre-made libraries of functions. Remember the explanation of functions earlier in the video? If we turn this sideways it becomes more obvious how abstraction works in programming. A function is at a higher layer of abstraction than the code it contains. And then let's say we had a function that called multiple other functions, then that would be at an even higher level. Let's take a look at a more appropriate example. At the most fundamental level, computers understand machine or binary code, which is a series of ones and zeros called bits. Eight bits together form a byte, and as I'm sure you know, this is where the terms megabyte, gigabyte and terabyte come from. Machine code is far too convoluted and time consuming for a human to create. So languages that are closer to English have been designed to make it easier for a regular person to write. When you write and run code in a modern programming language, the instructions are usually compiled into a format that the computer understands. For example, if you tell the computer to say hello world on the screen, this single instruction will be converted into an intermediary language, where it will become a longer sequence of smaller commands, which in the end will be interpreted as a sequence of bytes by the computer. Of course, this is an oversimplification, and there are many exceptions to this structure because as already stated, not all languages work the same way. But as you can see, modern programming languages sit at a higher layer of abstraction than machine code because it allows us to control many smaller processes with fewer commands. So far we've talked about the different types of logic and abstraction. These are both important concepts to understand, but just to add to our original argument about why being good at maths is not an absolute requirement for programming, we can say the following. Most scripting or programming usually makes use of code libraries that are at a high layer of abstraction, meaning that the expression of logic is more instructional or conversational than mathematical, except for where bespoke functionality is required that demands an understanding of a specific mathematical subject. Because of this, writing basic programs to make exclusive use of common procedures requires nothing more than an understanding of basic operations for arithmetic and the ability to clearly explain instructions in a way that is not obscure. We'll talk more about obscurity later. A lot of programming involves accessing variables and functions from objects of some kind. Imagine you're writing your script and there's a specific function you want to call, but it's stored in a pre-made library called Useful Things. I might decide to look up how to get to this function in some documentation or an online help forum, and find that I have to enter the following line. UsefulThings.Functions.DoSomething There's a bunch of words with periods separating them, and a couple of brackets at the end, but what does this mean? Well, what we're essentially looking at is a type of address. Think about how a web address or a file directory works. You start off in one folder, and then level by level you descend into other folders until you find the file you want. This is essentially what's happening in our example, except instead of slashes we're using periods to navigate to different areas. 
What we're saying is, inside of the useful things library, I want to look for the functions area, and then look inside of there for the do something function. This is generally how you navigate through data in programming languages. Most languages follow this kind of syntax. The two brackets at the end of do something tell us that this is a function. Usually we can put extra information inside of these brackets to give the function more data, but you'll learn more about that when doing a programming course. Now like I said, we're not going to be doing any proper programming in this video, but I want to demonstrate this method of accessing data by quickly moving over to Blender. I have a scene with a cube here, and above I have a console where I can access all of the data in the scene by making use of the Python language. In this particular case, I can get the selected object by typing bpy.context.active underscore object. Blender also has a useful autocomplete system that shows you all of the accessible data from this address. You can see this by putting a period after the object and then pressing Ctrl plus space. See how it now shows all of the data we can access at this address. Some of these are functions, some of these are variables, and some are more complex data types such as classes, which you'll learn more about when studying a language of your choice. Okay, one of the last concepts I want to talk about in this video is just as much a life skill as it is a programming skill, and that's knowing when to be specific, or alternatively, avoiding obscure statements. In programming, it's very important to be clear with your instructions to avoid situations where the computer isn't really sure what you're trying to say. If the compiler doesn't know what to do when turning the code into lower level instructions for the computer, it will either show you an error or just behave in a way that you didn't expect. There are two parts to being specific that we need to think about, which are obscurity and the order of operations. In terms of obscurity, I mean knowing how to break complex tasks down into simple steps that can only ever lead to one specific outcome. Strictly speaking, if many people read the same set of instructions, they should all end up with the exact same result. To give an example of how to not be obscure, think about a couple of classrooms. Let's say that you wanted the students of one classroom to join the students of another. Well, just saying classroom A plus classroom B doesn't really make sense because it's open to interpretation. A classroom doesn't just include the students, it also refers to the whole structure of the room, as well as all the furniture, the stationery, windows, etc. So what does it mean to add a whole classroom to another classroom? Instead, what we want to say is that we want to specifically take the students from one classroom and add them to the students of the other classroom. Keeping in mind what we said about accessing data, our new solution might look something like this. Classroom A.students plus Classroom B.students. Notice the periods where we're accessing the students' data contained inside of the classroom objects. But this still doesn't tell us where the students should end up. We're just adding them together, so the computer wouldn't know whether we wanted to put the students from class A into class B, or the students from class B into class A. The way to solve this would be to structure it like the following. Classroom A.students equals Classroom A.students plus Classroom B.students. Here we're saying that we want to make the students of Classroom A equivalent to the combination of students from class A and B. This way, the computer knows where we want the final number of students to end up, which is Classroom A. Moving on, the order of operations refers to the order that arithmetic operations are performed. For example, we can put brackets around mathematical statements to tell the computer which parts to calculate first. But in programming, this doesn't just apply to numbers. In many languages, we can use the same method to tell the computer which order to compare data, which is useful for making things happen under specific conditions. If you feel a bit daunted by the idea of learning a programming or scripting language, just keep in mind that once you've become proficient with one, it will become much easier to learn others. A concept we haven't talked about in this video is something called object orientation. This is something that's usually associated with languages that are more difficult and complex for beginners to learn. But one thing I will say is that if you learn a language that is based around object orientation, then learning any other language afterwards will be so much easier. But if you've never touched a scripting or programming language before and don't know where to start, it entirely depends on what you're interested in doing. If you're interested in web development, then HTML, CSS and JavaScript would be a good place to start. If you're interested in writing regular programs that you can run on your computer, then Python is a good entry language because its written syntax is much closer to regular English than other languages, and as well as this, it's also very multi-platform. If you want to be more ambitious and write proper desktop applications or video games, then one of the larger languages would be a good thing to aim for. C++ is very powerful, but as I say, the learning curve is pretty steep for a beginner. Over time, everyone finds languages that suits their needs and helps them to make the projects they want to make. Personally, my favourite languages to use are c and Python, but that's because I've done lots of development work with the Unity Game Engine and Blender, which interface with these languages respectively. However, I am currently also planning projects with Godot and Electron, so the time I spend with each language will fluctuate depending on what I'm working on. Alright, so now that we're reaching the end of the video, I want to talk about some exceptions to things I've said. 
I use the example of the robot arm to explain when mathematical logic would be applied. In reality, you may never need to use mathematical logic to perform any actions with a robotic arm. If you have a library of functions to help you tell the robot what to do, then you are using a higher layer of abstraction, and the logic will become instructional again. This would usually happen to save the programmer from having to manually create algorithms to calculate the kinematics of the entire system. Another exception is that earlier I demonstrated how mathematical operations could be used on things that weren't just numbers by adding these names together. Adding text together like this won't work in every language. It's a process called concatenation, and in some languages you would have to write this out in a different way. Okay, that's where we're going to leave it for this video. You can follow me on social media to keep up to date with content, and also join our Discord server to take part in discussions, share your work, and get sneak previews of upcoming projects. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.